We got hurt. And we had. Ah! <laughs> she had much fun. She had much fun, real much fun. And fun, 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 fun. Hello, hello, and hello, hello. hello. This is your boy Izzy from WizzyProDizzy.com. I want to say thanks for watching and send out some special prayers and blessings to everybody who's watching and everybody around the world from Hashtag Animal Radio. We love you. Stay strong. I'm known as Izzy Pro Dizzy on stage and social media, but my real name is Isaac Barker. Biblically, that means the laughter of God. And that veers into my topic today. Thankfully, I've been able to live up to my name and put as many smiles on as many faces as I could in my lifetime. Today, I'm here to bring you what I believe is a life change of report. Today, I hope to illuminate the power of laughter and positivity, as well as teach you how a smile can go a mile. By combining prevalent research regarding the power of a smile and the effect of our body language on our minds, I hope to instill in you the power of positivity and the power to help yourself and the people around you with a new positive mindset that can help you extend your life. A couple of months ago, I was working at an incredibly strenuous job as a houseman at a busy hotel. Like every other job I've held in my life, I've tried to make the work environment a pleasant atmosphere to be in. An atmosphere which everybody could breathe. I enjoyed my time there, despite being paid lower wages as a temp worker, and I was able to make all the guests and my co-workers laugh and smile, even the grumpiest ones. My supervisor, on the other hand, was a tough cookie to crack. I believe I only made her smile about a dozen times during my five months at the job, as opposed to all the others where I could easily induce laughter or a smile. Nonetheless, I was a hard worker and a valued team member. Well, baby, uno más día en la presa. I don't know what the heck is in my hair. Two man's a worker, probably some linen with some fuzz. The elevator's broken again, baby. What's up with all that? My dang, babe. I don't even think my key works for this job. They be playing me. He don't even work as hot in this hallway. What's up? Well, babe. I'm in this hot old stairwell again. What is up? What's up with the elevator in this place, man? Last time I nearly died trapped in the hallway because the door was locked. Now the door's locked again. <laughs> All right. Things are starting to get real in this hallway. This key. This key still won't work. This other key I got still won't work. I'm starting to drip sweat. I keep knocking. Nobody there. Put the service foot elevator down. Service elevator's right in there. But because it's down, I have to go all the way around the hotel like twice. Slap number three. It's a slow one. This ain't even the worst. That's to come. I gotta do water next. This video today is brought to you by Nestle. Pure life water. What doesn't kill you make you stronger. I think. This video is brought to you by Scott Brand Tissue. Don't fight when it's time to wipe. Man, be working it. Uh, my bag. Stay strong out there. Bless up, everybody. One morning I was working, and I remembered something I learned over a decade ago. I remembered hearing, if you smile for 30 seconds a day, scientists say you're guaranteed to have a better day and live longer because of it. If I remember correctly, the same report mentioned 
happy people have higher expectancies than people who live upset or unhappy lives. At the time, 30 seconds of a smile was chump change to me. These were my high school years. Fortunately, I ran a very successful catering business and was a local favorite making many friends at the town's Taco Bell. I took heed in the research, but never had to force myself to smile or to think about it. I do remember passing the info on to whoever I could. But that day at work at the hotel, drawing from other connections to smiles dormant in my subconscious, I realized if smiling makes you live longer, I'm actually giving life to a person when I make them smile. I figured if smile leads to longer life expectancies and instantaneous positive physiological reactions, then that means a smile or a laugh can give a person life. One smile may not add a year to your life, but if a smile can add a fraction of a second to someone's life, I'm happy with that. My coworkers agreed. One even knew of the research I spoke of, concurring with my theory. They also gave me extra thanks for making them happy at work. In the 21st century, misinformation can be one of the most devious and treacherous things in this day and age of information. So I wanted to do my research before I did this video, as not to misinform you myself. I could read you long lists and bland articles to prove my theory is true. I could start by telling you about the extensive longitudinal, longitudinal observations on different populations involving tens of thousands yielding positive results in life expectancy because happiness played a role. But my friends always tell me I sound like I'm giving a lecture when I have something important to say. Today, instead of quoting a bunch of articles and sounding like I'm your math teacher, I would like to use some TED Talks instead. This one is from Rut Gutman. Ron Gutman. Sorry, Ron. When I was a child, I always wanted to be a superhero. I wanted to save the world and make everyone happy. But I knew that I'd need superpowers to make my dreams come true. So I used to embark on these imaginary journeys to find intergalactic objects from planet Krypton, which was a lot of fun but didn't yield much result. When I grew up and realized that science fiction was not a good source for superpowers, I decided instead to embark on a journey of real science to find a more useful truth. I started my journey in California with a UC Berkeley 30-year longitudinal study that examined the photos of students in an old yearbook and tried to measure their success and well-being throughout their life. By measuring the students' smiles, researchers were able to predict how fulfilling and long-lasting a subject marriage will be, how well she would score in standardized tests of well-being, and how inspiring she would be to others. In another yearbook, I stumbled upon Barry Obama's picture. When I first saw his picture, I thought that his superpowers came from his super color. <laughs> but now I know it was all in his smile. Okay, in my defense, and in the defense of many other successful people, or soon-to-be successful people, I didn't smile brightly in my yearbook photos. But I had much success in my life. In high school, I used to bench over 200 pounds, and I played rugby vigorously. I had a muscle head and barely had a neck, and I was pretty tough. And I'm pretty sure my yearbook, I, I didn't have a lot of good yearbook days. There was always something going on. I always had to take the picture too many times. It's like she never got the good smile. I was like, ah, whatever at the time. But I remember my picture, a little something like that. Another aha moment came from a 2010-10 Wayne State University uh, research project that looked into pre-1950s baseball cards of major league players. The researchers found that the span of a player's smile could actually predict the span of his life. Players who didn't smile in their pictures lived an average of only 72.9 years, where players with beaming smiles lived an average of almost 80 years. The good news is that we're actually born smiling. Using 3D ultrasound technology, we can now see that developing babies appear to smile 
even in the womb. When they're born, babies continue to smile, initially mostly in their sleep, and even blind babies smile to the sound of the human voice. Smiling is one of the most basic, biologically uniform expressions of all humans. In studies he conducted in Papua New Guinea, Paul Ekman, the world's most renowned researcher on facial expression, found that even members of the Fori tribe, who were completely disconnected from Western culture and also known for their unusual cannibalism rituals, <laughs> attributed smiles to descriptions of situations the same way you and I would. So from Papua New Guinea, to Hollywood, all the way to modern art in Beijing, we smile often and use smile to express joy and satisfaction. How many people here in this room smile more than 20 times per day? Raise your hand if you do. Oh, wow. Outside of this room, more than a third of us smile more than 20 times per day, whereas less than 14% of us smile less than five. In fact, those with the most amazing superpowers are actually children who smile as many as 400 times per day. Have you ever wondered why being around children who smile so frequently make you smile very often? A recent study at Uppsala University in Sweden found that it's very difficult to frown when looking at someone who smiles. You ask why? Because smiling is evolutionarily contagious and it suppresses the control we usually have on our facial muscles. You don't think smiling is contagious? Try looking at a picture of my baby brother now without smiling. This picture got over 3,000 likes on Facebook in less than three days. Mimicking a smile and experiencing it physically help us understand whether a smile is fake or real, so we can understand the emotional state of the smiler. In a recent mimicking study at the University of Clermont-Ferrand in France, subjects were asked to determine whether a smile was real or fake while holding a pencil in their mouth to repress smiling muscles. Without the pencil, subjects were excellent judges, but with the pencil in their mouth, when they could not mimic the smile they saw, their judgment was impaired. I also heard of this research project before. Though I have not fully researched it, I heard placing a pen or pencil in your mouth does force a smile. So if you're one of those people who needs to smile more every day, but things are so eerie and gloomy you can't even leave, lift your cheeks, bite down on a pen or pencil and force yourself to smile as an exercise for better health. But don't forget to wash that pen or pencil off. Things. Remember, things might be bleak and eerie, but every day above ground is a good day. Give thanks. To use the words of Skip Marley, tell me that's not true. The wise Ross Damian Marley tells us in his lyrics, it's better you smile instead of you cry, and even better you laugh. Because these things, the Rasta man know and people know, it's better for your health. I don't need a big old science report to tell you, but I'm just giving you a big old science report to tell you. Better you build a bridge than instead of you build a wall. Better to love and last than to never have loved that all. Better to do today than instead of you putting it off. Tomorrow not sure and that is for sure, so better you give it to all. A true me Marley brethren, so true. Now back to the TED Talk with Ron Gutman. In addition to theorizing on evolution in the origin of species, Charles Darwin also wrote the facial feedback response theory. His theory states that the act of smiling itself actually makes us feel better, rather than smiling being merely a result of feeling good. Uh, in his study, Darwin actually cited the French neurologist Julien Duchamp, who used electric jolts to facial muscles to induce and stimulate smiles. Please don't try this at home. <laughs> In a related German study, researchers used fMRI imaging to measure brain activity before and after injecting Botox to suppress smiling muscles. 
defining supported Darwin's theory but sh by showing that facial feedback modifies the neural processing of emotional content in the brain in a way that helps us feel better when we smile. Smiling stimulates our brain reward mechanism in a way that even chocolate, a well-regarded pleasure inducer, cannot match. British researchers found that one smile can generate the same level of brain stimulation as up to 2,000 bars of chocolate. <laughs> Wait, the same study found that smiling is as stimulating as receiving up to 16,000 pounds sterling in cash. That's like 25 grand a smile. It's not bad. And, and think about it this way, 25,000 times 400, quite a few kids out there feel like Mark Zuckerberg every day. Wait, 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 wait. Hold up, pause. I don't know what set of grumpy rich people they gave 16,000 sterling pounds to, but if you gave that money if you gave 25 grand to 95% of my friends, all of them would go way, way, all their response, physiological responses would go way off the charts compared to an irregular smile. I mean, I feel overwhelmed when I see people winning big on prices, right? One chip at a time, put up against the wall, drop it, 10,000 right in the middle. Good luck, man. Five chips. Here we go, guys. Go win some money. Here comes tip number one, 10,000 in the middle, 10,000 in the middle. Oh my 10, God! Oh my God! 10, oh my God! Oh. Get another one. Do it again. Okay. Here we go. Same spot. $1,000. Yeah! yeah! Got 11,000 bucks so far. Oh my gosh. Still has two chips. Ryan, Ryan, Ryan. Killing the game. Here we go. Ten thousand dollars. Back, 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 back. Five hundred bucks. Yeah. Twenty-one thousand five hundred. Here's his last Number chip. Number five. Number five. Number five. Drops it right on the end. Good luck. More pricey oh games coming up in the second half of the show. Yeah! For people who really appreciate that money, that money's a lot more than a smile. But that goes to show you, a smile goes a long way. A smile is worth like 2,000 bars. A chocolate can't even make you smile if you're that depressed. Bite down on a pencil, save yourself the calories. And unlike lots of chocolate, lots of smiling can actually make you healthier. Smiling can help reduce the level of stress-enhancing hormones like cortisol, adrenaline, and dopamine, increase the level of mood-enhancing hormones like endorphin, and reduce overall blood pressure. And if that's not enough, smiling can actually make you look good in the eyes of others. A recent study at Penn State University found that when you smile, you don't only appear to be more likable and courteous, but you actually appear to be more competent. So whenever you want to look great and competent, reduce your stress, or improve your marriage, or feel as if you just had a whole stack of high-quality chocolate without incurring the caloric cost, or as if you found 25 grand in a pocket of an old jacket you hadn't worn for ages, or whenever you want to tap into a superpower that will help you and everyone around you live a longer, healthier, happier life, smile. You may not be a performer like me, or a funny comedian like my Uncle Heavy. Daddy, what you doing? You patting them little dads like it's a pack of cigs. You gotta get the sugar right, girl. You know what I'm saying? Get it all packed in the same area so when you know, when you open it up, you're ready. 
You know what I mean? Sometimes they ain't got the sugar consistency the way you want it. So I'm gonna you going to squish them. They ain't going to squish. I got this. I've been doing this a long damn time, girl. Or my cousin, Sawyer Boy. Hey, 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 please don't shoot, don't shoot, don't shoot. Give me the money, boy. Give me the money, boy. Wait, the only thing I get on me right now is two dollars, but this is all I get in my name right now. What? I got two dollars supposed to do for me, boy. What I supposed to do with two dollars, boy? What two dollars supposed to do for you? What two dollars supposed to do for me? This is all I get, boy. All around you looking and thinking everything good because I got all this little suit and tie. No, you all think things good, eh? But you know, not happening on this, boy. Let me paycheck to paycheck, boy. You pay my rent, Lord. I don't want nothing else, boy. My kids need food. But I, I don't want it. I don't want it, boy. All you know, boy. I don't have two dollars. Pay me two dollars. That's all I have, man. Hey, let me show you something, boy. I know how it is, no, boy. You need to fix this little paycheck, the paycheck that you doing, boy. That ain't working for you, boy. That ain't working for you, boy. Find something to go, boy. And deal with that way. You know, you go along, man. I get a couple of dollars, yeah? Get your uh, kid something to eat and then, like. Feel me? Uh -huh. Feel me? Fix this paycheck, the paycheck thing, boy. Thank you. That ain't working Thank for you, boy. God must send you. God had to send you. <laughs> I need to do better with my life. I need to do better. You may not be a comedian pumping life into thousands, but you do hold great power as well. It's behind your contagious smile and the way you carry yourself. So now you know a great and easy way to make you and everybody around you live longer, happier, more fuller, more extensive lives. Isn't that powerful? It's funny how Mr. Gutman refers to smiling as a superpower. After, rep after performing in cities all over the country, I've told many people and club managers and promoters, my superpower is to make people dance and get fun. <laughs> tell them when I'm in the town, the knee doctor is in business. I'm only 5'7", but when I start the show, everybody is bent at the knee dancing. <laughs> adversity. But not everybody is inheritably the same or have experienced what I have that made me so. Fear not, because there are simple postures and exercises to allow you to become a more confident and powerful person, all while improving your life and well-being. I know this video is going on long, but if you bear with me, the next TED Talk from Amy Cuddy can illuminate some simple steps and exercises to actually become a more powerful and confident person while dropping stress levels in less than five minutes. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit the thumbs up, follow and subscribe to all of our pages and the pages of our artists and the pages of the news representations that I put on the channel because uh, we love supporting everybody in the jungle. One love, one jungle. Uh, one thunderstorm. We're all together in this one. We're rumbling together. So I want to start by um, offering you a free no-tech life hack. Um, and all it requires of you is this, that you change your posture 
for two minutes. But before I give it away, I want to ask you to right now do a little audit of your body and what you're doing with your body. So how many of you are sort of making yourself smaller? Maybe you're hunching, um, crossing your legs, maybe wrapping your ankles. Sometimes we hold on to our arms like this. Uh, sometimes we uh, spread out. <laughs> I see you. Um, so I want you to pay attention to what you're doing right now. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. And I'm hoping that if you sort of learn to tweak this a little bit, it could significantly change the way your life unfolds. Um, so we're really fascinated with body language. And we're particularly interested in other people's body language. You know, we're interested in, like, you know, um, a... Uh, uh, an awkward interaction or a smile or a contemptuous glance or maybe a, a very awkward wink um, or maybe even something like a handshake. Here they are arriving at number 10 and uh, look at this lucky policeman gets to shake hands with the President of the United States. Oh, and here comes the Prime Minister of the... No. <laughs> A handshake or the lack of a handshake can have us talking for weeks and weeks and weeks, even the BBC and the New York Times. So, so obviously, when we think about nonverbal behavior or body language, but we call it nonverbals as social scientists, it's language. So we think about communication. When we think about communication, we think about interactions. So what is your body language communicating to me? What's mine communicating to you? And there's a lot of reason to, be to, to believe that this is, this is a valid way to look at this. So social scientists have spent a lot of time looking at the effects of, of our body language or other people's body language on judgments. And we make sweeping judgments and inf inferences from body language. And those judgments can predict really meaningful life outcomes, like who we hire or promote, um, who we ask out on a date. For example, uh, uh, Nalini Ambadi, a researcher at Tufts University, shows that when people watch 30-second 30 30 soundless clips of real physician-patient interactions, their judgments of the physician's niceness predict whether or not that physician will be sued. So it doesn't have to do so much with whether or not that physician was incompetent, but do we like that person and how they interacted. Um, even more dramatic, Alex Todorov at Princeton has shown us that um, judgments of political candidates' faces in just one second predict 70% of US Senate and gubernatorial race outcomes. And even, let's go digital, emoticons used well in online negotiations can lead you to claim more value from that negotiation. If you use them poorly, bad idea, right? So, so when we think of nonverbals, we think of how we judge others, how they judge us, and what the outcomes are. We tend to forget, though, the other audience that's influenced by our nonverbals, and that's ourselves. We are also influenced by our nonverbals, our thoughts and our feelings and our physiology. So what nonverbals am I talking about? I'm a social psychologist. I study prejudice, and I teach at a competitive business school. So it was inevitable that I would become interested in power dynamics. I became especially interested in nonverbal expressions of power and dominance. Um, and what are nonverbal expressions of power and dominance? Well, this is what they are. So in the animal kingdom, they are about expanding. So you make yourself big, you stretch out, you take up space, you're basically opening up. It's about opening up. And this is true across the animal kingdom. It's not just limited to primates, and humans do the same thing. So they do this both when they, when they have power sort of chronically, and also when they're feeling powerful in the moment. And this one is especially interesting because it really shows us how universal and old these expressions of power are. This expression, which is known as pride, uh, Jessica Tracy has studied, she shows that people who are born with sight and people who are congenitally blind do this when they win at a physical competition. So when they cross the finish line and they've won, it doesn't matter if they've never seen anyone do it, they do this. So the arms up in the V, the chin is slightly lifted. What do we do when we feel powerless? We do exactly the opposite. We close up, we wrap ourselves up, we make ourselves small, we don't want to bump into the person next to us. So again, both animals and humans do the same thing. 
And this is what happens when you put together high and low power. So what we tend to do when it comes to power is that we complement the other's nonverbals. So if someone's being really powerful with us, we tend to make ourselves smaller. We don't mirror them, we do the opposite of them. And this is really important in the MBA classroom because participation counts for half the grade. So business schools have been struggling with this gender grade gap. You get these equally qualified women and men coming in, and then you get these differences in grades, and it seems to be partly attributable to participation. So I started to wonder, you know, okay, so you have these people coming in like this and they're participating. Is it possible that we could get people to fake it and would it lead them to participate more? So my main co collaborator, Dana Carney, who's at Berkeley, and I really wanted to know, can you fake it till you make it? Like, can you do this just for a little while and actually f experience a behavioral outcome that makes you seem more powerful? So we know that our nonverbals govern how other people think and feel about us. There's a lot of evidence, but our question really was, do our nonverbals govern how we think and feel about ourselves? There's some evidence that they do. So, for example, um, when we, we smile when we feel happy, but also when we're forced to smile by holding a pen in our teeth like this, it makes us feel happy. So it goes both ways. When it comes to power, um, it also goes both ways. So when you, when you uh, feel powerful, you're more likely to do this, but it's also possible that um, when you, when you uh, pretend to be powerful, you are more likely to actually feel powerful. So the second question really was, you know, so we know that our minds change our bodies, but is it also true that, that our bodies change our minds? And when I say minds in the case of the powerful, what am I talking about? So I'm talking about thoughts and feelings and the sort of physiological things that make up our, our thoughts and feelings, and in my case, that's hormones. I look at hormones. So what do the minds of the powerful versus the powerless look like? So powerful people, tend to be, not surprisingly, more assertive and more confident, uh, more, more optimistic. They actually feel that they're going to win even at games of chance. Uh, they also tend to be able to think more abstractly. So there are a lot of differences. They take more risks. There are a lot of differences between powerful and powerless people. Physiologically, there also are differences. On two key hormones, tes testosterone, which is the dominance hormone, and cortisol, which is the stress hormone. So what we find is that um, uh, high power alpha males in primate hierarchies have high testosterone and low cortisol. And powerful and effective leaders also have high testosterone and low cortisol. So what does that mean? When you think about power, ten people tended to think only about testosterone because that was a, about dominance. But really, power is also about how you react to stress. So do you want the high power leader that's dominant, high on testosterone, but really stress reactive? Probably not, right? You want the person who's powerful and assertive and dominant, but not very stress reactive, the person who's laid back. So, we know that in, uh, in, in primate hierarchies, if an alpha needs to take over, uh, if, if an individual needs to take over an alpha role sort of suddenly, within a few days, that individual's testosterone has gone up significantly and his cortisol has dropped significantly. So we have this evidence, both that the body can shape the mind, at least at the facial level, um, and also that role changes can shape the mind. So what happens, okay, you take a role change, um, what happens if you do that at a really minimal level, like this tiny manipulation, this tiny intervention, for two minutes you say, I want you to stand like this and it's gonna make you feel more powerful. So this is what we did. We decided to uh, bring people into the lab and run a little experiment. And these people adopted for two minutes either high power poses or low power poses. And I'm just gonna show you five of the poses, although they took on only two. So here's one, a couple more. This one has been dubbed the Wonder Woman by the media. Here are a couple more. So you can be standing or you can be sitting. Uh, and here are the low power poses. So you're folding up, you're making yourself small. This one is very low power. When you're touching your neck, you're really kind of protecting yourself. 
So this is what happens. They come in, they spit into a vial. We, for two minutes, say, you need to do this or this. They don't look at pictures of the poses. We don't want to prime them with a concept of power. We want them to be feeling power, right? So two minutes they do this. We then ask them, how powerful do you feel on a series of items? And then we give them an opportunity to gamble. And then we take another saliva sample. That's it. That's the whole experiment. So this is what we find. Risk tolerance, which is the gambling. What we find is that when you're, the, when the, when you're in the high power pose condition, 86% of you will gamble. When you're in the low power pose condition, only 60%. And that's a pretty whopping significant difference. Here's what we find on testosterone. From their baseline when they come in, high power people experience about a 20% increase and low power people experience about a 10% decrease. So again, two minutes and you get these changes. Here's what you get on cortisol. High power people experience about a 25% decrease and the low power people experience about a 15% increase. So two minutes lead to these hormonal changes that configure your brain to basically be either assertive, confident, and comfortable, or really stress reactive, um, and you know, feeling sort of shut down, and we've all had that feeling, right? So it seems that our nonverbals do govern how we think and feel about ourselves. So it's not just others, but it's also ourselves. Also, our bodies change our minds. But the next question, of course, is can power posing for a few minutes really change your life in meaningful ways? So this is in the lab, it's this little task, you know, it's just a couple of minutes. You know, where can you actually apply this, which we cared about, of course. And so we think it's really what, what, what matters, I mean, where you want to use this is evaluative situations, like social threat situations. Where are you being evaluated, either by your friends, like for teenagers it's at the lunchroom table. It could be, you know, for some people, it's speaking at a school board meeting. It might be giving a pitch or giving a talk like this or um, doing a job interview. We decided that the one that most people could relate to because most people had been through was the job interview. So um, we published these, these findings and the media are all over it and they say, um, okay, so this is what you do when you go in for the job interview, right? <laughs> you know, so we were of course horrified and it said, oh my God, no, 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 that's not what we meant at all for a new, numerous reasons. No, 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 don't do that. Again, this is not about you talking to other people, it's you talking to yourself. What do you do before you go into a job interview? You do this. Right? You're sitting down, you're looking at your iPhone or your Android, not trying to leave anyone out. Um, you are, you know, you're looking at your notes, you're hunching up, making yourself small, when really what you should be doing maybe is this, like in the bathroom, right? <laughs> Do that, find two minutes. So that's what we want to test, okay? So we bring people into a lab, and they do, a couple, they do either high or low power poses again. They go through a very stressful job interview. It's five minutes long, they are being recorded, they're being judged also, and the judges are trained to give no nonverbal feedback. So they look like this. Like, imagine this is the person interviewing you. So for five minutes, nothing. And this is worse than being heckled. People hate this. It's, it's what Marianne LaFrance calls standing in social quicksand. So this really spikes your cortisol. So this is the job interview we put them through because we really wanted to see what happened. We then have these coders look at these tapes, four of them. They're blind to the hypothesis, they're blind to the conditions, they have no idea who's been posing in what pose. And they, they, they end up looking at these sets of tapes and they say, oh, we want to hire these people, all the high power posers, we don't want to hire these people. We also evaluate these people much more positively overall. But what's driving it? It's not about the content of the speech. It's about the presence that they're bringing to the speech. We also, because we rate them on all these variables related to sort of competence, like how well structured is the speech? How good is it? What are their qualifications? No effect on those things. This is what's affected, these kinds of things. People are bringing their true selves, basically. They're bringing themselves. They bring their ideas, but as themselves, with, with no you know, residue over them. So this is what's driving the effect or media, mediating the effect. So um, when I tell people about this, that our bodies change our minds and our minds can change our behavior and our behavior can change our outcomes, they say to me, I don't, it feels fake, right? So I said fake it till you make it. Like I don't, it's not me. Like I don't want to get there and then still feel like a fraud. I don't want to feel like an imposter. I don't want to get there only to feel like I'm not supposed to be here. And that really resonated with me because 
I want to tell you a little story about being an imposter and feeling like I'm not supposed to be here. When I was 19, I was in a really bad car accident. I was thrown out of a car, rolled several times. I was thrown from the car, and um, I woke up in a head injury rehab ward. And I had been withdrawn from college.、Um, and I learned that my IQ had dropped by two standard deviations, which was.、Um, Tr- very traumatic. I knew my IQ because I had identified with being smart, and I had been called gifted as a child. So I'm taken out of college. I keep trying to go back. They say you're not going to finish college. Like just you know, there there are other things for you to do, but that's not going to work out for you. So I I really struggled with this, and I have to say, having your identity taken from you, your core identity, and if, for me it was being smart, having that taken from you, there's nothing that leaves you feeling more powerless than that. So I felt entirely powerless. I worked and worked and worked, and I got lucky and worked and got lucky and worked. Eventually, I graduated from college.、It、took me four years longer than my peers, and I convinced someone, my my angel、uh, advisor, Susan Fisk, to take me on. And so I ended up at Princeton, and I was like, I am not supposed to be here. I am an imposter. And the night before my first year talk, and the first year talk at Princeton is a 20-minute talk to 20 people. That's it. I was so afraid of being found out the next day that I called her and said, "I'm quitting." She was like, "You are not quitting because I took a gamble on you, and you're staying. You're going to stay, and this is what you're going to do. You are going to fake it. You're going to take. You're going to do every talk that you ever get asked to do. You're just going to do it and do it and do it, even if you're terrified and just paralyzed and having an out-of-body experience until you have this moment where you say." Oh my gosh! I'm doing it. Like I have become this. I am actually doing this. So that's what I did. Five years in grad school, a few years. You know, I'm at Northwestern. I moved to Harvard. I'm at Harvard. I'm not really thinking about it anymore. But for a long time, I had been thinking, not supposed to be here. Not supposed to be here. So the end of my first year at Harvard.、Um, A student who had not talked in class the entire semester, who I had said, "Look, you got to participate, or else you're going to fail," came into my office. I really didn't know her at all, and she said, she came in totally defeated, and she said, "I'm not supposed to be here." <laughs> and that was the moment for me because two things happened. One was that I realized. Oh my gosh! I don't feel like that anymore. <laughs> you know, I don't feel that anymore. But she does, and I get that feeling. And the second was, she is supposed to be here. Like she can fake it. She can become it. So he's like, "Yes, you are. You are supposed to be here. And tomorrow you're gonna fake it. You're gonna make yourself powerful. <laughs> and you know, you're gonna." <laughs> and. You're gonna go. You're gonna go into the classroom, and you are gonna give the best comment ever, you know. And she gave the best comment ever, and people turned around. They were like, "Oh my God! I didn't even notice her sitting there," you know. She comes back to me months later, and I realized that she had not just faked it till she made it. She had actually faked it sh- till she became it. So she had changed.、Um, and so I, 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 I want to say to you: Don't fake it till you make it. Fake it till you become it. You know, it's not do it enough until you actually become it and internalize. The last thing I want to leave you with is this: tiny tweaks can lead to big changes. So, this is two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, two minutes before you go into the next stressful evaluative situation. For two minutes, try doing this in the elevator, in a bathroom stall, at your desk behind closed doors. That's what you want to do. Get configure your brain to cope the best in that situation. Get your testosterone up. Get your cortisol down. Don't leave that situation feeling like, oh, I didn't show them who I am. Leave that situation feeling like, oh, I really feel like I got to say who I am and show who I am. So I want to ask you first, you know, both to try power posing, and also. I want to ask you to share this science because this is simple. I don't have ego involved in this. <laughs> Give it away, like share it with people because the people who can use it the most are the ones with no resources and no technology and no status and no power. Give it to them because they can do it in private. They need their bodies, privacy, and two minutes, and it can significantly change the outcomes of their life. Thank you. Remember, presence is important, and there is power in your smile. 
When I go down to City Hall and work with the Music Ambassador Squad or shake hands with the mayor, kiss babies, if, if that's a thing. <laughs> Shake hand, kiss baby. Shake hand, kiss baby. Shake hand, kiss hand. Shake baby, shake baby. Kiss hand, shake baby. Shake baby, kiss hand. Like if I'm downtown, I'm dressed, I'm dressed to kill, as they say in my neighborhood. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm down there fly. I gotta, I gotta present myself a certain way. Whether it's music, I'm going down there for the community, so I can make, so I can be a, 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 a political activist in my community. I'm going down there with my music gear. You know, I'm Izzy Pro Dizzy, straight up. When I'm on the media, I'm Izzy. You know what I mean? If we 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 having a cup of tea, we talking, we having lunch. You know, I'm Isaac, but I'm out here. I'm out here making a good name name for the game out here. You know what I mean, so I want everybody to smile, live more, drop your cortisone levels, become a powerful leader, make people smile and laugh, and take hatred off your heart. And please share this information, just as Amy Cuddy says. It helps the people who need it the most. These simple power poses and positive changes can help lives incrementally and exponentially. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Blessings and prayers from Animal Radio. We rule the jungle. One heart, one love, and one big thunderstorm.